Thank you, Tracy. When I was little, I had some friends who had a toy that I really wanted to have one of the sort, and that was a remote-controlled car. And as I would play with them, they would have these remote-controlled cars out, and I would get to play with them periodically. And I thought they were really so neat. I thought they were just wonderful, and I really wanted one for myself. That being said, I knew that remote-controlled cars were not inexpensive, and I was uh, reluctant to even ask my parents for such, thinking, that, well, there's no way they're going to spend that kind of money on a toy like that for me, so I never even asked. But I was with my parents one day, we were going through the mall, and we stopped in a Radio Shack, and as we're walking around in the store, I noticed that Radio Shack was selling these remote-controlled Jeeps, little army Jeeps, and they were uh, about this big. And what really caught my attention about these is that compared to other remote control cars, they were very inexpensive. As I recall, something on the order of maybe $15. That was a lot cheaper than anything else I'd ever seen. And apparently I found my parents in charitable, charitable mood that day because uh, I asked them about this and they decided they would buy this for me along with the batteries to go inside of it. And I am just ecstatic to have this new remote control car. I am big time now. I, I've been waiting for this moment my entire life. All seven years, I suppose, at that point. And I get home, and I, I can't wait to get this thing out of the box. I unpackage it, I get the batteries in it, and I'm ready to, to be able to try this thing out. Now, the, the controls for this one were very different. In fact, altogether, by comparison, very simple to, compared to that of other remote control cars I'd ever seen. There is no little steering wheel on it, no little trigger button that controls the speed of it, or whether it's forward or reverse. The only thing that's on this remote is one red button. That's it. And how this remote control car works is that you turn the Jeep upside down, you flip it in the on switch, and it begins, the wheels begin to move forward. You set it down, and it just takes off. And if you want to control its direction anyway, you just press that red button. And what it does is that it causes the remote control to go back and to the left, reverse to the left. So if I want to get it to go down this aisle, it may veer off to, to, to the left, and so I'm going to press the button, and it's going to back up to the left. Well, that's okay unless I suppose you want to go left and then you realize what you've got to do. You've got to go back to the left, back to the left, back to the left. And you know, Baptists are against dancing and so that's not... Uh. <laughs> But it would just take forever, and I'm out in the driveway with this, and at first I'm so initially excited to have this. I'm thrilled to have this toy. I'm big time now. I've got this remote control car, my own remote control car, until I discover just how lousy this thing actually is. And it, it is proving to be, uh, for me, a real source of frustration and anger because even the slightest adjustments you can't just steer it you have to go back to the left back to the left it was so frustrating what I finally wound up doing is if I want it to go in a different direction I just walk over and pick it up and set it in that direction it kind of defeats the whole remote controlled purpose I suppose but it was enormously frustrating to me this thing this Jeep of mine was quite frankly making me mad and it was making me mad because what it was doing I didn't want it to do. You've been there before, haven't you? Perhaps it was with some type of electronic device, maybe a computer. Those can be frustrating because you're trying to get it to do something and whatever it's doing, that's not what you want it to do or when you want it to be done. That's frustrating with technology, but it's even more frustrating when we think about it in terms of relationships, isn't it? When those in your life with whom you have a relationship, a family member, a close friend, it's enormously frustrating. It is anger spawning when you're in that relationship and what they are doing, well, that's not what you think they should be do doing. And what they are doing, you want it to be done differently or you want it to be done at a different time. That is very frustrating. Those that you're in a relationship aren't doing what you want when you think it should be done. Now that's true in our relationships with each other. We can experience that type of anger and frustration, but it's also true that we can experience that in our relationship with the Lord. Have you ever wanted or asked or expected the Lord to do something in a particular way? And you've asked the Lord, hey, I need you to do this, and I need you to do this at this particular time, and what he does, well, it's not that. You've, you've been there. You may be even right now in that place of frustration where, quite frankly, you are getting mad at Jesus because what he's doing and when he's doing it, that's not according to your plan. 
Well, this morning we're continuing in a series of messages that I've called Mad at Jesus, looking at people in the New Testament who, for various reasons, get mad at the Lord. And today I want you to see a man who gets angry for the reason that we have just described. Jesus wasn't doing things how and when he thought they should be done. We find him in Luke chapter 13. If you would look in your Bibles with me there today, look with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 13. We're going to begin reading with verse 10. I hope you have or can grab from the pew rack a copy of God's Word because nothing I say today is as important as what God says here. Luke chapter 13 beginning with verse 10. Luke tells us that Jesus was in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, There are six days on which men ought to work, therefore come and be healed on them, and not on the Sabbath day. And the Lord answered him and said, Hypocrite. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman, be, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it. For 18 years he loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. All right, so we or told this story through the lens of, of Luke's eyes, and he records Jesus on the Sabbath day being in a likely place. He was in the synagogue, at a synagogue. You may wonder, what's the difference, or maybe you might not have, but it's important to know the difference between the synagogue and the temple. There was just one temple, and it was this monstrous, elaborate, uh, uh, amazing building, but it was in Jerusalem. But not everyone lived in Jerusalem, and so in the various towns and villages and cities and hamlets throughout Galilee, there would be these local places of worship where on a week-to-week -week basis people would gather that were called synagogues. And at different points throughout the year, faithful Jews would all on special days make their way to Jerusalem to the temple, but on a week-to-week -week basis on the Sabbath day where they would find themselves was in the synagogue. And so as Jesus is traveling out and about, he is in this particular town on the Sabbath day, and he goes into the synagogue, and he is teaching. And we're told in verse 11 that as Jesus is teaching, there was a woman who was present there that day, a woman that Luke says had a spirit of infirmity. What is a spirit of infirmity? Well, infirmed or infirmity means something about a physical condition, an ailment of some sort. But Luke describes it as being a spirit of infirmity. What this is a reference to is the, the fruit of the work of a demon. It is either demonic oppression or it is demonic possession. This demonic assault on her had physical consequence. It caused her to be bent over where she literally could not stand up straight. Uh, she probably looked like Quasimodo because for 18 years she's just kind of been hunched over. And the implication is that she went to bed one day and she was doing great but then literally got up the next morning and could not raise her shoulders back. She could not stand up straight. And for 18 long years she has been living like this. Well, it's important to recognize what is going on there in terms of Luke's description. He describes this as being a spirit of infirmity. If you were to flip channels this afternoon on your TV and uh, find some religious broadcasting, uh, you may very well find, and in fact it's almost certain, you will find some preachers on TV today, in particular those of the faith healing uh, lot, that they will teach and they describe that every sickness, disease, and ailment is the fruit of some sort of demonic attack. That someone has the spirit of cancer or has the spirit of heart disease or has the demon of diabetes or whatever it is. Let me be very clear. I believe, because it was true in the first century and there's no reason that it should not also be true in the 21st century, that demons were alive and well then, they are alive and well today. As they oppressed individuals in the first century and uh, possessed and oppressed them, so too I believe that occurs 
in the 21st century. And just as sometimes was the case back in the first century, it is today, sometimes uh, when this occurs, it produces physical consequence or physical ramification. That being said, I do not believe, and I believe it is wrong, and I believe it's uh, not faithful to the Scriptures to teach that all disease, all sickness, all ailments are the result of either Satan or one of his demons. In fact, Jesus, in verse 32 of this passage, or of this chapter, makes a distinction between casting out demons and bringing about cures. That's the difference between possession and the difference between that and disease. So with that being said, though, Jesus sees this woman. He recognizes not simply her physical condition, but he recognizes the source of this. This is not uh, a spinal cord or a, a spine problem. This is not scoliosis. This is not osteoporosis or, uh, as my grandmother used to call it, osteopoposis. <laughs> that one was free. Anyway... Um, that was not the reason she was experiencing this. Rather, it was because of the, the work and the, the fruit of some demon possessing or oppressing her. And so what we're told is that Jesus saw her. He calls out to her and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. He then lays his hands on her, and she was immediately made straight. And... All of a sudden, her posture is restored to that which is normal. She can raise and rear her shoulders back. She can stand up straight and look up at the sky with, with minimal effort for the first time now in almost two decades. She's thrilled about what Jesus has done. She glorifies God in verse 13 because of it. But verse 14 makes clear that not all there that day were thrilled about this. In particular, the ruler of the synagogue, he was not pleased at all. He wasn't thrilled and he wasn't glorifying God whatsoever. Now the ruler of a synagogue, and each synagogue had a person in this capacity. They were effectively the chief administrative officer of each local fellowship. Among the things that were entrusted to their care was the planning of worship services, deciding who would participate in those in terms of leadership and what exactly it was that they would do. When push comes to shove, everything in terms of activity or worship that would go on in a synagogue, the ruler of the synagogue was responsible for this. This would have been a, a, truly a religious leader. Perhaps he might have also been a Pharisee. We do not know. All we do know for certain is that he has witnessed this miracle, but he is not happy whatsoever. And he decides to to castigate, he decides to rebuke Jesus. Notice verse 14 says that the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. Indignation is one of the synonyms for anger. He is ticked about what he has just witnessed. And so he wants to call out Jesus, and he's going to do so publicly. And though he's not going to say to Jesus, hey, you've done this, he wants to address the crowd, but in doing so, his real target is Jesus. And he says, and you can imagine with a, a snooty tone, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them, not, emphatically not, on the Sabbath. So he, he's seeking to use this, at least publicly, the pretense is I'm going to, to teach everyone now. But what he's really wanting to do is to make Jesus aware, I'm ticked about what you've done and what you have done. I do not approve of that you did it and when you did it. He's angry. He's mad at Jesus. When Jesus responds with a rebuke of his own, he first begins by calling him a hypocrite and then offers a rhetorical question. He says, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? So you guys, on the Sabbath day, you've got these animals, and though you don't take them out into the fields to work them, you do take them out of their stalls and lead them to water so that they can get a drink on the Sabbath day. You meet your ox or your donkey's need, but here, he says, you've got this woman. She's a daughter of Abraham, which is to say she is a Jewish woman that Satan is bound. Think of it, Jesus says, for 18 years. It's okay to get and meet the need of your ox or donkey, but not okay to meet the need of a person. This woman that's a part of this fellowship, this woman that's, that's part of the covenant people of God, you can meet your animal's need, but you can't meet a person's need on the Sabbath? 
Verse 17 says, And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. It silences their argument. And all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by Jesus. What I, I want you to do, though, is to think with me for a moment and try to characterize or classify the rationale for this ruler of the synagogue's anger. He, he's mad at Jesus and he's got a beef with Jesus. What category would that go into? Well, you could say it was because it was, res re it was uh, reserved and it was based on violations of Sabbath regulations and limitations, but I want you to think more generally than that. His beef was with Jesus because he did not like what Jesus did when he did it. When you think about it more in general terms like that, it may very well feel as though perhaps you're looking in the mirror. You ever been mad at the Lord because you didn't like what he did when he did it? You have found yourself at some time in the past experiencing your own season or circumstance of adversity. And you begin to call out to the Lord. You say, okay, God, here is my problem. And I need you to work. I need you to intervene. I need you to step into this. And this is what I need you to do. This is when I need you to do it. And this is how it should all unfold. And so you give all of this nice, neat, and tidy to Jesus. And you say, here, I've I planned it all out for you. You give it to him in prayer. And then Jesus does exactly, well, not that. Been there before? You probably have. And if you haven't, you're going to be tempted to, want to experience those same uh, feelings of anger and frustration with the Lord. Because you can get to the point where he's, what he's doing and when he's doing it, it just, quite frankly, makes you mad. So before those occasions present themselves and you're tempted to go in that direction in the future, let me share with you a couple of lessons of application that I, I believe may very well help you based on what we see here. And here's the, the first application. What Jesus does addresses real need. What Jesus does addresses real need. Understand that God never randomly or by chance does anything. There's nothing that God, in terms of his activity, that he ever does well, oh, I don't know, without thinking, without plan, without purpose. Everything is intentional and specifically related to what he does in the lives of people. What he does in my life or in your life or any person's life, whatever he does, all of his activity is rooted in his awareness of your real need. Everything that he does in the life of any person is rooted in his awareness and understanding of real need. I think even the scriptures themselves bear this out. You recall once God had, had created the world, he'd created uh, this paradise known as Eden. He's created uh, Adam, he's created the first man. And what does God do after he's done this? He says, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helpmate suitable for him. And so he creates Eve. Well, why did he do that? Because he recognized Adam had a need. Adam had a need. Well, what about when, when the Father sent the Son into the world? Why, why did God actually go to the trouble of sending Jesus into the world in the first place? You're familiar with John 3, 16, but what about verse 17 where we're told that God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved? What was the purpose? Well, it was to meet the needs of people. We needed a Savior. We needed to be saved from the consequence of sin. Everything that God does, all the activity of God in the lives of people is rooted in his awareness of actual and real need. Why did Jesus make this woman whole? Why did he uh, do this work where she was able to stand straight? Because she had a need. But what I want you to understand is that the needs Jesus meets are in keeping with what he knows to be the actual and real need. Luke is very clear about that in this passage. This woman's need ultimately was not physical, was it? It really wasn't. She ultimately had a spiritual need. 
Jesus, recognizing that, meets the spiritual need, and that has physical consequence. That's why, and it's important, Jesus does not say to this woman, you are healed. What does he say? He says, you are loosed. What he does is corresponding to what he knows the actual, the real need is and was. The casual onlooker, even this woman herself, she might have been completely oblivious to that fact. People would have just said, well, she's got a spine problem. She's got a posture problem. She's got a, a bone problem. It's physical in nature. That's what she needs is someone to address that. That wasn't the problem. That wasn't the need. The real need was spiritual in nature, and that's exactly what Jesus does because every time he interacts in the lives of people, it is to address real need. Well, why is that distinction important? Well, it goes to what I just said a moment ago, which again is this. What Jesus does addresses real need. That's a very different animal than what you think is your need or you perceive as your need. Let me give you an example. Uh, last weekend, I had uh, all the kids except Andrew with me. My sister was in town. He was uh, with, with her. And uh, we had gone to the new field and stream, and then I took them uh, next door to the Dollar Tree. And I told the kids, hey, you can pick out uh, something here that you want. You know, after all, it's a dollar, and so they are each over in the toy aisle looking for some priceless treasure to make their own. Well, what Philip settles on is this deck of magic cards. And I don't want to ruin this for everybody, but I'll let you in. On, there, are a, there are particular types of magic cards that are sometimes referred to as shaved or stripper decks. And what, what that means is that there is one side of the card that unless you're paying very careful, close attention, you can't tell that it is shaved ever so slightly on that side. I won't again reveal everything but what that enables the magician to do is to feel in the card so that he can re reveal the volunteer or the subject's card that they have randomly placed in the deck anyway so uh, this is what Philip wants uh, we buy it we get home he's really excited about this I've used these decks of cards before and so I'm going to explain to him and show him how to use this you ever heard the adage you get what you pay for that is absolutely true at the toy aisle at the Dollar Tree and these cards, the, the material it was made of, was so cheap and they were so horribly done, you couldn't, feel, you couldn't feel the right card. And after a few attempts, I just simply cannot get this deck of cards to work. And I said, Philip, I, I'm sorry, these things are just so cheap. You know, maybe at some point what we can do is to look in, maybe even go online and see if we can find a better deck of these magic cards. Well, Philip hears that and he absolutely takes that to heart few minutes later he comes back to me and says hey daddy have you looked online and ordered those cards for me yet <laughs> well no Philip uh, no no I haven't we'll, we'll look into that at some point later but daddy I really need uh, a new deck of cards well, well Philip we'll, we'll look into that later an hour later Philip is coming back to me hey daddy have you especially if he saw me, if I've picked up a tablet or a smartphone or something he's thinking maybe I have ordered this hey daddy have you ordered that deck of cards for me yet no Philip I haven't we'll, we'll look into that maybe there's another store we can go to here in Greensboro or I'll look online uh, but I haven't done that yet well daddy I really need that deck of cards so I, I need you to do this several times three or four times in just the span of a couple of hours on that Saturday afternoon he is is telling me Hey, and asking me about looking online because he says, I really need that new deck of cards. Well, did Philip need a deck of magic cards? Like a hole in the head, right? He didn't really need this. But because I'm older and because I'm a bit wiser and because I, I know more than he does, I'm able to recognize and I understand that which he really needs and distinguish it from that which he really wants. Because I know more than he does, I'm able to distinguish that which he really needs and that which he really wants. Well, let's, let's raise the stakes a moment. Who knows more, you or Jesus? Jesus. Because he knows everything. In fact, who even knows more about you? You or Jesus? Well, Jesus does. 
Not only because he knows what's going on in your, your mind and heart, but he knows everything about your body because he made it. He made it. Because he knows everything about you, like I was with Philip, he knows exactly what I need, exactly what you need, and is able to distinguish between that and what you really want. And what he does is not going to always address the want, but will always address the need, because he knows the need, the real need. And so when you find yourself or you are tempted to get frustrated and angry at the Lord, he's not doing what I want, how I expected, and when I wanted it done. When you're just waving your fist at heaven, remind yourself what Jesus does, all of it in my life and in yours, addresses real need. What he knows and is certain is the real need. But there's a second layer of application going on here, which is this. What Jesus does eventually makes sense. What Jesus does eventually makes sense. All right, so back in this passage, the, the leader of the synagogue, he, he is mad. He is ticked at Jesus. The nerve of this guy showing up here at my synagogue, the one that I'm responsible for, and it's not simply that he uh, assumes the position to be able to heal somebody, but he does that on the Sabbath day of all days. The nerve, the gall, the temerity of this man who does he think he is, Jesus? Well, to understand a bit more fully his anger, you need a bit more background. And background that you may even be familiar with. But you remember when God gave the law through Moses to people, among the, the regulations and restrictions was this, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. That's, that's a big one. It made it into God's top ten list, right? In, into the Ten Commandments. Honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And God's rationale, and he explained it. Six days a man will work, but on the seventh day he's to rest. In fact, he gives himself in his own example as the rationale for that, as God did in the week of creation. He worked for six days, but on the seventh day he rested. God says, I want you to follow my example in this. This seventh day is reserved for rest and for worship. Well, when, when God gave that regulation, when he imposed those limitations, it was not because he wanted to adversely affect productivity or efficiency. In, in fact, God had no negative motivations whatsoever. The motivations behind that were all entirely positive. And it's because God understands that you and I are not machines and that we cannot and should not in perpetuity just continue to work day in and day out because if we do, it's going to have very adverse consequences. Your body is just simply going to wear out. Your mind is just going to get fried. Your health will begin to deteriorate. And so God says, do not do this. You work six days and you stop. Your body needs the rest, but you also need time to be able to give concerted, focused attention to the things of God. So the Lord had given this mandate, he had given these regulations, but they were fairly general in nature, weren't they? Work six days, the seventh day don't work. That's for rest and worship. Not very specific. And so what happened is that people began wondering, well, I know going out in the field and plowing, that's work, but can I, can I cook lunch on the Sabbath day? Is, is that work? And what happened, and it, and, and it grew over time, is that the religious leadership of the various generations began to provide the specifics that God never did. They began to come up with rules, lots of rules, that would describe all of the behaviors that were appropriate on the Sabbath day and those that were not. So, for example, on the Sabbath day, you could take a certain number of steps I mean, it, it even got that specific. You can walk this many steps. Up to that is fine, but if you take one more, one, you have worked. Shame, shame, shame. That's bad. And so it was very, very, very specific. But what I want you to understand is that God never gave those specifics. God never gave those specifics. People generated these specifics. And among the things that they did was to create themselves for themselves a number of exclusions. So, for example, you could not on the Sabbath day take your ox or your donkey out in the field to work them, but you could take them out into the field if you're taking them down to the stream so that they can get something to drink. 
that's okay. That's not work. Uh, but among the things that was work was uh, any healing. Healing, you, you do not do that on the Sabbath day. That's, that's work. And that's why the ruler of the synagogue is so incensed. He is so mad at Jesus. But understand that he is mad at Jesus, and it is not because Jesus has violated a rule that had been given by the Father. When push comes to shove, he's mad at Jesus because what Jesus is doing is violating his own personal sense of what's appropriate based on nothing more than human tradition. And so Jesus, after having been rebuked publicly, also responds in kind and rebukes this religious leader publicly. He begins by calling him exactly what he was, a hypocrite. And effectively offers this rhetorical statement, the principle of which is, or the essence is very simple. You're okay in meeting the need of an animal on the Sabbath day, but not the needs of people. You, you create these rules where you can help an animal, but you cannot help a person. Go figure. Explain what sense that makes. If you're going to be against one, you ought to be against both of them because that is nothing more than inconsistent hypocrisy. When Jesus, though, saw this woman, he recognized, identified what her real need was, and he met it. But notice verse 17. After this exchange occurs between Jesus and the ruler of the synagogue, when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. More specifically, the religious leader, the ruler of the synagogue, was put to shame. It's as if Jesus and this man are in a chess match. And the religious leader, as he's just addressed the crowd, saying, okay, six days you're to work. You can heal on those days, but not on the Sabbath. He thinks, I've got him now. Got him now. He's cornered. He, there, there's no way out of this. And then Jesus offers that one statement and says, checkmate. He knows that Jesus has got him. And Luke says, is put to shame. Now, that's not an insignificant statement. And you've got to think about the rationale behind that. The only way that statement could be true is if this ruler of the synagogue realized and came to understand something. You know, Jesus is right. He's got a point. It is, in fact, okay to meet the need of people, even on the Sabbath. Jesus is, in fact, right. Well, that's important because it leads us back to our thought of application. What Jesus does eventually makes sense. What Jesus does eventually makes sense. Now, I say that recognizing that it may take some time. In some instances, it may take a lot of time. It may require God showing you something that you have yet to discover in His Word. It may be that, that God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, prompts you with a, a particular thought or burden or, or motivates someone to say something specific to you. Again, it may take a lot of time. In fact, it may even take you finally getting to heaven. But what I promise you is this. Whatever Jesus does, it will eventually make sense. Now, initially, the temptation is to shake your fist at heaven. God, I'm mad. Jesus, I'm mad at you. I, I gave this to you as a nice, neat, tidy package. What to do, how to do it, when to do it. And that's not what you've done. In fact, I don't, I don't get what you're doing. I've asked you this, and I'm sitting back, I'm watching, I'm scratching my head, and I'm thinking, that doesn't make any sense. I, I, I can't understand why in the world you would do this when I've asked for that. What I'm telling you is, eventually, it will make sense. It eventually made sense to the ruler of the synagogue why Jesus did what he did when he did it. And that's because the activity of God addresses real need. My dad has a, a, a pickup truck that he bought, I don't know, 13, maybe 14 years ago now, and it's got low miles. I don't think it's even got 50,000 miles on it at this point. And uh, it is so because he, he drives his car back and forth to work, and the truck is just for, you know, weekends or going to pick up a load of mulch or pine needles or something like that. 
Uh, physically, the truck's in great shape. Mechanically, it is fine. Paint job is uh, in good shape. It keeps it clean inside and out. Uh, truck's in great shape, except for a couple of years ago, my parents, I was talking to them on the phone one day, and they said something about uh, the headlights on the truck had just gotten yellowed and dingy, dull looking. And maybe your car, in fact, my car right now is starting to, to look like that. The, the headlights, they brand new, they were so clear, but over time, they get kind of cloudy and yellowed looking. Well, when they said that, I had just, because I take Consumer Reports magazine, I had just recently read a review of these do-it-yourself headlight cleaning kits. And there was one in particular that they said uh, did really, really well and caused the headlights to look new. And what I did, I went to an auto parts store, I, I bought one of those and gave it to my dad as a gift. Some weeks later, I was talking with my mom on the phone, and I said, uh, hey, has Daddy uh, used that kit yet? She said, yeah, you know, just yesterday we did that. And she began to explain the process. She said the instructions said, and it comes with everything you need, but there's some tape that you put on the paint around the headlight to make sure that none of the chemicals or anything gets on the paint of your car. And so you smear this creamy substance on the headlight, and then there's this series of what appears to be really fine sandpaper, and it tells you that you know, you're supposed to like kind of sand the, the surface of this. And she said, it, not only did it take a while, but for the, almost the entirety of that time, we're thinking we are, we've just ruined this headlight because it goes from bad to worse. Now, at first it looked just kind of cloudy, but now it looks just terrible. And she said, but we kept doing what it said, and then all of a sudden, it's like it goes from terrible, and then all of a sudden, it's like it's clear. And then all of a sudden, it's like it looks brand new. We did exactly what it said, and it did exactly what it promised. For a while, though, it looked even worse, but eventually it got clear. You know what? Our walks with God are consistently going to be very similar to that. And we're going to bear our hearts to the Lord and we're going to explain to him how we see our circumstances and by virtue of that we're going to ask him based on our, our personal sense of want or our personal awareness of need. God, I need you to do this. Jesus, I need you to act in this way and I need you to do it by this date and this is how it's going to unfold. And so you, you give that to him and then you sit back and wait and watch and you begin to see some activity but what he's doing initially doesn't make sense. And initially, you're kind of frustrated. You're thinking, Lord, I, I don't get this. This problem has gone from bad to worse. But if you keep following and keep trusting, I promise the cloudiness will begin to fade and things will become altogether clear. And at that point, you're recognizing not simply that Jesus has done things differently than you might have asked or wanted but because of that he has accomplished an even greater good you know what we've been talking about this morning when you get down to the brass tacks is a trust issue is it not why is it that you or I or any would get mad at the Lord when he's not doing what we want when and how we want it because we've got a trust problem because we think, I know better than he does what the need is. I know better than he does how all of this should unfold. My question then for you very simply is this. Have you been getting mad at him? Have you found yourself like this religious leader, this ruler of the synagogue, getting mad because Jesus has not done what you wanted, how you wanted it done, and when you wanted it done? Well, it may very well be quite simply because of this. You do not trust as you should. What the Lord is looking for you and for I is that we get, for you and for me, is that we get to the point where we know in our hearts everything that He does in my life and everything in yours is to address what He knows to be the real need. And even though I don't get it, and it may not even for a lengthy season of time make any sense to me, eventually it will. And because of that, I'm going to keep trusting. And I'm going to take my fist down and I'm going to seek exchanging, seek to exchange being angry and mad at him to start pursuing a relationship where I am mad about him. Will you bow your heads with me?
circumstances that we have talked about this morning, if you have known the Lord for any length of time, you have been there. You've asked him to do something. You had in mind how it should be done, when it should be done, and you gave it to him as a nice, neat, tidy package. But what he did was altogether different. And you found that initially to be very frustrating. In fact, maybe even now, you're saying, Michael, that's me. I, I've been ticked. I hope that the Lord, through the truth of His Word and the power of His Spirit, has helped you to understand or to remember everything that He does is because He, far better than you, knows what the real need is. And all of His activity in your life and mine will address that. Not my wants, not my perception of need, but His knowledge of the need. Maybe right now you're in that, that phase where you're just kind of scratching your head and there's so much that simply does not make sense. What God's doing is very differently than what, different than what you anticipated and asked or desired. And you're scratching your head saying, God, I don't get it. You've been frustrated. You've been angry. Well, if, if you're in those places today, or you have been, my encouragement for you is to talk to the Lord about it. Will you just confess to him what you know to be true, that he knows better than you what the real need is? Will you ask him to give you patience as you're waiting for him to make things clear? Will you confess to him that in all likelihood you're experiencing these frustrations because you've not trusted as you should? Maybe you want to do that while you're seated in your pew, or maybe you just want to kneel at this altar. And just even through your posture say, Lord, um, I've been mad mad at you I don't want that anymore what I want to be is to be mad about you maybe there's something else God is calling you today to do perhaps it's to find out how you can become one of his followers how you can have a personal relationship with him maybe it's to become a part of this church maybe you just need to kneel at this altar and say God here's my heart here's my burden and I'm giving this to you knowing you see better than I do what the need is and I'm just trusting you to work whatever it is that you do God has spoken because he wants you to respond. Lord, thank you for being a God that really does know everything about us. From the number of hairs on our heads to the thoughts that are being entertained underneath that hair. You know all of it. And because of that, God, we candidly admit that you know exactly what our real needs are. There are real needs that people came into this room with this morning. And you, through the power of the Spirit and through the truth of your word, are seeking to work to address those needs. I cannot begin for a moment to pretend that I know what those are, even for myself, much less for anyone else. But Lord, you do. And as you have and you are speaking to people, as you're prompting individuals to make decisions, I pray, God, that for your kingdom's sake, for your personal delight and for our own experience of your blessing, I pray that we respond with faith and obedience. We commit this time of decision to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you.